Welcome to the Sugar Science. We're here with Jacob Hexer Sorensen um, in Copenhagen. He is um, part of a company called Gubra, and he's going to speak to us about imagining diabetes using light sheet microscopy, an amazing new tool um, that is uh, poised to advance drug discovery in metabolic diseases. Welcome, Jacob. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the latest development we've been trying out using this uh, technology called light sheet imaging. And uh, it's basically a way that you can image a whole uh, organ like the mouse pancreas at a single cell resolution and thereby obtain very high quality data. Uh, but it's also possible now using image analysis to quantify different aspects of various endpoints. And I'm just going to go briefly through this. But um, one of the things that makes 3D imaging uh, adv advantageous over traditional uh, immunologic chemistry is the possibility that you can go in and look at the, not all islets in a combination, but you can go in and look at the volume or the, whether there's other cell types like uh, proliferating cells, senescent cells, uh, inflammation associated with each individual islet and therefore give you a much uh, more detailed picture of how uh, diabetes might be involving. So um, in, or, in addition to being beautiful, it's also very quantitative. Exactly, so we can count the total amount of beta cells. We can go in and we can look at the volume. We know the spatial distribution, so we can also, maybe not so relevant in a pancreas, but we, you, because we know this distribution within the organ, you can say whether it's close to a surface or whether it's close to blood vessels, things like that. So the things I'm going to cover is how to label the beta cells, how we do that. Then uh, I'm going to present data we have from two different uh, experiments. We've done one type mouse model of type 1 diabetes and one for type 2 diabetes. And then I'm going to discuss a little bit how the potential for looking at different uh, other things in the during diabetes uh, development and progression. Fantastic. So thank you. So first, uh, for labeling the beta cells, as you all know, the beta cells are located within the pancreas, uh, consisting of uh, little clusters called islets of Langerhans. So uh, the first approach is basically you take out the pancreas and you label it using antibodies. Uh, and here it's uh, showing an insulin staining of a mouse pancreas, wild type mouse. And you can see the islets clusters uh, distributed within the pancreas here. Here you can also basically use any conventional antibody that is uh, known, so CHI-67, I'm going to show that. You can look for inflammation using CD45 and, and other things like that. The other approach mm -hmm. is basically to look um, where you use in vivo distribution of uh, various things. This could be uh, GLP-1. So because the GLP-1 receptor is expressed on the surface of the beta cells, you can add a fluorophore to this peptide and inject it into a mouse and then let it distribute for a while. And then what you get is actually labeling of all the beta cells. You could imagine doing th similar things with other uh, therapeutic antibodies targeting the beta cells or nanobodies. Uh, I'm also gonna show a little bit how we injected an antibody in, and in the end, uh, labeling uh, the capillaries in the pancreas and in the islets. Great, so, so you these can really get a whole landscape. You can get a real landscape, including inclusive of islets and the neighboring structures like the capillaries. Exactly. And I think this, this is a, where it becomes really informative because the capillaries, they're so branched and difficult to study. And, and looking at them in the whole uh, context uh, looks really great and it's very informative. So I'm gonna show a little bit about that in the end. So the way the technology works is it's actually quite simple. So once you have stained the organ or you isolate it after injecting a, a peptide or an antibody, basically you clear it. So you put it into a solution that make, makes it transparent. And once you have done that, you can shine light through it. So here, what you see here is the imaging chamber where we put in a sample uh, and you have light shining through from both sides. And what that does, it illuminates a single plane within the tissue. You then move your tissue through this light sheet. And basically what you do is you just collect uh, all the different sections. You could compare those to normal uh, immunochemistry. Uh, 
But the difference is because you have all of them uh, sequentially positioned on top of each other, you can reconstruct them into 3D using software afterwards. And this is just uh, part of a pancreas stain for insulin that you can then see. Um, so the first experiment we did was actually to see whether we could uh, go in and affect the beta cell volume uh, pharmacologically. And it's been known from for many, many years that you can do it uh, during pregnancy or certain uh, treatments with peptides. But uh, what we really wanted to do was look in a wild type mouse. Um, so these are diomice. Uh, and we then implanted a pump containing either a vehicle or a peptide called uh, S961. S961 is a little peptide that binds the insulin receptor, but without activating it but it binds so strong that it actually prevents insulin from binding. So what you get is a, a diabetic model because insulin no longer works um, and they're obese at the same time. Mm -hmm. So here you have the vehicle group have normal blood glucose, but the mice that had been transplanted with a pump containing S961, you can see how they become diabetic. Then after two weeks, we took out the pancreas from these uh, mice and we stained them for insulin and Chi-67 uh, to see if we could change the volume of the, the beta cell volume. So I'm going to show you here. So this is now the pancreas, the whole pancreas from one of these mice treated with S961. And here you see all the beta cells in the entire pancreas. Um, I'm just for visual purposes going to crop it down a little bit. But what you can see when you zoom in here is you can actually go in and you can see here the little green spots. They are nuclei for Chi-67 uh, positive cells, which meaning they're beta cells that are dividing. Um, so this is nice because we can then go in and we can look at all the islets. We can segment them out. So here we just basically see all the islets um, and we can count them, but we can also color code them according to their volume. So here now you have uh, the purple ones being the smallest and the reddish being the biggest. Um, but we can also go in and look at which ones has then Chi-67. And as you can see here, it's not all of them. Uh, some islets have Chi-67 cells, but others don't. Now, if we just go back to the presentation here, then when you start quantifying this, you can actually see that the mice transplanted with the S961, within two weeks, they actually expand the beta cell volume uh, 43%, uh, which is quite amazing. And we could also see an That's upregulation wild. of uh, yeah, Chi-67, suggesting that proliferation is the main driver uh, of this expansion. So That's because great. we can... Yeah, because we can do this uh, segmentation based on, on size, we can also go in and we can look at the, you know, is it just some population of beta cells that are, or islet sizes that are dividing, or is it all of them? Uh, and if you look across the whole group, you can see that the S961 treated mice, they actually have a right shift, suggesting that they have more and bigger islets. Um, so that tells us a little bit about the dynamics in this model that you, you have seem to have all the islets responding to this uh, lack of insulin by proliferating quite dramatically and increasing the, the beta cell, the size of the islets and the total beta cell volume. Yeah, this seems like it's a, a very powerful tool to watching the landscape of the islets of the, of the endocrine pancreas as you change experimental variables. And it just comes to mind that this would be such a great tool to use when people are developing organoids or you know, implantable islets, things like that. Exactly, and I think, so the possibility that you can, I, and Chi-67 is just one marker, you can imagine many other markers like senescence markers or you know, uh, neogenesis markers like neogenin-3, de-differentiation markers, all these kind of things you could combine uh, with the insulin to, to see how the different islets respond uh, to treatment or, you know, also in organoids and things like that. Yeah, this has a lot of room to, to play around with and to really get some interesting results. Exactly.
Yeah, so so uh, so the next model I'm going to show is a, is a model of type 1 diabetes. So it's basically just not mice that we took. And then, uh, as most of you probably know, the disease progression, they, they start developing diabetes around 14 weeks. So, so we took some mice and uh, took out the pancreas at, uh, at when they had normal blood glucose at 14 weeks. And then we took mice that uh, after 18 weeks when they had become diabetic. And then, uh, like before, we measured the blood glucose and we could see a dramatic increase in the BG in, uh, in the 18 week old mice. And again, we took out the pancreas but, and we stained for insulin, but instead of CHI 67, we stained for CD45 to label the, the immune cells that are infiltrating the eyelids. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I'm just going to show you here. Uh, just switch this up. So now we have a pancreas here. Uh, this is again the insulin stain here where you can see the eyelids. Um, but what is quite dramatic is if you then turn on um, the immune uh, CD45 channel, you can actually see how the immune cells have started attacking the eyelids. You can see it's quite uh, random. So some eyelids like this one down here is heavily infiltrated by the neighboring, the neighboring eyelids that are not affected yet. And wow. again, that's so, it's so patchy. Yeah, I know, I know. It's really, and, and I think this is, to me, the strength of looking at the whole pancreas, because if you did a section, you could hit eyelids. Uh, you can even see how polarized it is. So if you hit this eyelid in the wrong place, you would not see the, the immune cells. Whereas yeah. if you hit it uh, in another place, part where, where there is inflammation, um, but you can see here, it's actually, when you zoom in, you can see it's uh, basically uh, just starting attacking this islet here. And, and like before, we can go in and we can segment out the beta cell volume. But instead of uh, asking whether the cells proliferating, we can ask which one of the islets actually are associated with the immune cells. And again, you can see here, that the, the red means that they are inflamed, they are actually infiltrated, uh, whereas the purple ones, they are not yet um, being uh, infiltrated by the immune cells. It's a, it seems so interesting to me that you could also compare contrast the human and mouse model, um, because we know, right, that the cytoarchitecture is different, or those, the anatomy is different in the two, those two model systems. So you could really use this to create uh, a landscape of immune filter infiltration in the different disease, you know, the different model systems. Definitely. And I think, uh, so, so it's something we are undertaking looking in human tissues. I would say uh, their size become a little bit of a problem because uh, you can only look at biopsies, right? Uh, so the maximum uh, volume we can scan at the moment is uh, a centimeter and a half in, in each dimension. Uh, so you would have to look at biases in the human, but it's a, I mean, there are several groups undertaking this, and I think it's going to bring in a lot of knowledge about the uh, diabetes uh, progression in humans also. Yeah, I mean, what, that's one of the primary questions is who, uh, which of the immune cells are first on the scene and in what capacity, you know, that all those questions could be answered with this fantastic tool. Yes, and I think... I, so at the, here we, we've labeled uh, two channels. It is actually possible to label up to four channels. So you could, if you have the available antibodies, you could imagine also labeling subsets of, uh, of immune cells within the islets um, at the same time. And uh, is this the paper you just recently published? Is this the type 1 diabetes uh, data? Yeah. Or so it's exactly the same. It's the data I'm showing here. So <laughs> it's uh, it's these two studies uh, that we published. Congratulations! This is uh, this you. is really fun to see this. Yeah, it's very informative. You get all carried away looking at it. <laughs> so, yeah, very so true. just like before, we also because we can quantify and count the the number of islets, we could also see here that if you look at the Islet size uh, and which ones are inflamed. You could see if you look at the large islets, it's actually 100% of the islets that are being infiltrated. Then uh, if you look at the smaller islets, you can see it's only 40%. Wow, so that's curious. Tells, yeah, so this tells a little bit about the, 
maybe the larger islets are more susceptible uh, for the infiltration. So I think this is a really interesting uh, observation. It's been shown before by Ulf Algren's group also. Uh, but what actually differentiates the large islets from the small islets uh, in terms of uh, how they're seen by the immune system? Uh, are, this is a question, a side question, but how close um, do the larger islets live to the blood supply versus the smaller islets, or does that yeah. matter? I will come back to that in a second. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> so that is a good question. Um, but, but I'll just show you here. So, so this is then the pancreas from the diabetic mice, right? And here, again, you can see, uh, first of all, there are very, very few islets left. Um, so you have a few here. Yeah. And now if you switch off, uh, switch on the, the immune channel, you can see that there are now, so whatever is left are now completely surrounded by immune cells and wow. are in the process of being killed off. Um, and if we quantify this, it's actually 100% of whatever is left. Uh, the, in many of the pancreatic, there was nothing left. Uh, and whatever was there was completely uh, encapsulated in immune cells. Wow. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, and this is just four weeks uh, that are separating these two groups. So I think it really, it's really dramatic. And I think also what is interesting is that, uh, I mean, the immune cells, then there might be some remnants here where you can see immune cells, but no longer any beta cells. But in most places, they have basically just cleared out. Uh, so there's nothing left of the beta cells. Do they stay, do the immune cells stay in residence there? Um, that's, that's, that's what it look, doesn't look like it. So you can see maybe, you can see a few places like here and here, where you see like a haze of, uh, of immune cells, uh, this one maybe. Uh, but if you consider how many islands there are in a, in a wild type mouse, there must be a lot of places where they have just left. Uh, once the beta cells are dead, they just seem to leave. Yeah, it's interesting because there's this whole model that some of the beta cells just become quiescent, and so that, and um, then the immune cells stop their attack. But it seems like in this particular situation, the cells have been taken out. So, so you can say, I mean, of course, if they no longer express insulin, we won't see them staining for insulin. Uh, so it might be that if you had another marker for quiescent cells, you might be able to identify yeah. some remnants of the beta cells. But I would say um, in most places, it looks like here, I mean, first of all, the islets are a lot smaller and, and they're completely surrounded. So. I think it doesn't look good if you're a beta cell. No, <laughs> it doesn't. Looks no. like a battle, <laughs> battlescape. I know. So, um, <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to show is um, duh, duh, duh. is this one here. So this is this is also so this is just the wild type pancreas that we we stained for for insulin. Um, and, and you can see when you just look here, just like you saw before, that you can see like it's pretty randomly distributed throughout the pancreas, but you have these big islets uh, located along here in the middle, and that's also well known. But when you then start looking at the vasculature, so this is a uh, staining for smooth muscle actin that labels all the, the bigger blood vessels and arteries in the pancreas. You can see this close relationship between the vasculature and the islets, yeah, and, which is really, I think, really unique. And uh, it looks, of course, it makes sense that the, the, the islets are associated with vasculature, and it's been well described also. But when you see it like this, you can see that the, it's not at all a coincidence where the islets are located. They're mm -hmm. also always in very close proximity to a blood vessel. Um, and, and we can also look at the capillaries. So, so one thing we also stain for was the nerves. Um, and here you can see in green. So that's a staining for TH, which label the sympathetic neurons. Wow. Um, and you can see how the nerves also seem to follow the same path along the blood vessels. Um, and then when you go in, and this is something, uh, 
if you look in the literature, it has been described, but there are these, in each islet, there's a little cluster of uh, TH positive beta cells. Hmm. Um, but you can see it's very polarized. So it's usually at one, uh, one of the poles of the islet. Uh, they are beta cells, they're not nerve cells. But it's really peculiar. Uh, and I don't think it's been looked at at the whole organ level before. But no, just that's like, amazing. Uh, it's almost like a sentinel or a pacemaker cell or something. That's that's what I've been thinking. That actually you have this maybe the nerves just touching the pole of the eyelid, uh, and then maybe uh, yeah, like a like a pacemaker, mm. maybe controlling insulin release. And I think yes. this is one of the things that uh, you know it's known that the, the brain plays a big role, maybe also in, in controlling blood glucose, and whether the brain could also be involved in controlling insulin release at this level. I, this is purely speculation. I have no way of. Uh, well, there has been a paper, uh, Philippe Guillaume and company in France did a paper last uh, year in the fall 2019 that showed, uh, you know, when they, um, when they severed the, uh, the vagal nerve, they, um, they were able to regain or, or stop the progression to type 1 diabetes in odd mice. So there is something going on there and others are now looking at it closely. I know that. So this is really, really neat to see this. Yeah. And, and just, to, just to show you, so like before, looking at the CHI-67 cells and then the inflammation, we can also ask which islets are actually TH positive um, or have TH cells. And you can see here again, looks like it's the, the bigger islets, um, but there's also a bunch of islets that are not TH positive cells within them. Yeah. So, uh, whatever that means, I have no idea. <laughs> well, it's great to see in a landscape configuration and then, you know, trying to experiment, <clears throat> experiment against it. Exactly. Yes. And I think, I mean, there are many, I mean, are these the same cells that are being attacked? Are these the ones that are most... Uh, you know, involved in insulin secretion is that, are the differences in how much insulin they secrete. I mean, these are these are all uh, I think interesting questions. So I'm just going to show you here. Um, so of course, the, the the blood vessels I showed here was uh, the smooth muscle acting that are labeling only the bigger blood vessels. Um, what we have done also is we have injected an antibody into a mouse that recognizes uh, fenestrated capillaries. So it actually labels the fenestrations within the capillaries. And it's well known that the islets are really um, highly vascularized. And it's just to show here that if we go through the stack, you can actually see how the blood vessels alone or the capillaries alone actually will show you where there's an islet. Um, wow. And of course, if you look at this in 3D, um, this, this is how vascularized the islets are, uh, if you look at a high detail. And I think this, this to me, is, uh, is really uh, some things that might be really important also in, in understanding the beta cells is the relationship to the vasculature. Because it's well known that, uh, you know, just blocking VGF and other things will impact the uh, insulin release and uh, and it's probably a big part. So OBOB mice have impaired vasculature. Uh, how much that actually influences uh, diabetes and diabetes progression, I don't know. But I think this is at least a tool where you could go in and you could look at the association between fenestration and uh, the interaction between the capillaries and the, and the beta cells. Yeah, it's something that the eyelid implant um people are looking at very carefully aren't they because they have to be very the eyelid implantation has to be very um highly vascularized to work i know so you could really use this to this tool to map um how that's going yeah and i think i mean it doesn't i mean you can have a perfectly healthy beta cell but if it, it doesn't have the necessary blood supply and the uh, and possibility of secreting insulin, it doesn't matter. So you have to have all these components restored, right? So, yeah, so I, I think 
this is what I'm going to show today, and uh, and I hope that it's you know maybe open up some. Uh, I think there are huge, tremendous opportunities in the technology, and uh, you know maybe it can be used. To, um, uh, I, I would also highlight the fact that you, uh, the Goober, does uh, do contract research. So if people are interested, um, to certainly reach out to you, and we'll provide that contract, uh, that uh, contact information, um, as part of our um, our series here. I think that uh, you know it could be a, a really great partnership as you develop more and more of an atlas, I guess, a video atlas or a visual atlas of this, you know, you could even um, be a resource for, for scientists as they um, further uh, understand the whole, the whole landscape of the islets and their interface with the other parts of the, the body, the capillaries, fibrosis, all those things. So this is just amazing. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you for inviting me. All right. Well, Best of luck and we'll be in touch. I can't wait to see, you know, uh, the next papers that come out of it. Thank you. Thanks again.